You know, I view life as a very real game in which there are no timeouts, no substitutions, and the clock is always running. I used to think it was a scrimmage or a drill that I'd get to instant replay my life, and I found out that every day is the Super Bowl, every day is the Olympics, every day is the World Series, every day is the Grand Final. Life is a real game. And the winners in life, oh, well, they're like you. They never whine. They come in fourth exhausted but exhilarated because they came in fifth last time. Winners treat animals like people and people like brothers and sisters. Losers criticize everyone and bring them down to their miserable level because misery loves company. A loser is a person in this abundant country that would like to look like, earn like, and take time off like somebody else, but doesn't work to try to become that, just wishes about it. A spectator in life wouldn't be here tonight and wouldn't be watching this. They're too busy escaping from the goals they never set and from the roles they can't imagine themselves to be in. But people like you, who seem to get what they want by giving other people what they need in a very natural, free-flowing way. I've been studying them like Jiminy Cricket. The reason I have is I'm hoping they'll rub off on me. I've always wanted to be a winner in my life, and I'll tell you, they have an uncommon way of thinking, a common denominator that winning was all in the attitude. It's all in how you look at it. Your attitude is either the lock on or key to your door of success. Either locks you out or opens it up for you. And I'd like to give you the attitudes and action steps that make a real winner in life. I mean the kind of winner that helps other winners too. If you win, I win. Only if you win do I win. And that's the real winner in life, the ones that build other winners too. I'd like to give you those high performance ideas that are common in people who become so uncommonly successful. And there are five winning attitudes I'd like to share with you tonight and today and the rest of your life. The first winning attitude that I found is positive self-awareness. What good does it do to be motivated to a dream if you don't see it for you, if you don't see your own potential? We've been selling ourselves short since we were children. You see, we associated ourselves with our mistakes. You never outgrow the limits you set. You only set new ones within which you must live. The limits of the human are self-imposed. I've been to the UCLA Brain Institute and I can tell you for sure, the human mind in the ability to create a new place to grow, to imagine, to remember, to make things that never existed before, to lead a new life, to get out of the ghetto to greatness, is unlimited, only limited by our own vision of ourselves. But somewhere along the way, we put the lid on ourselves and self-limited. I've decided to blow the lid off finally and get some positive self-awareness. If it weren't for the money, if I had the money, remember, remember old Walt? <laughs> I'll tell you, what a loser he was. Walt Disney, are you kidding? He was bankrupt for the second time. Can you imagine going in? What guts it takes. Had a hand puppet named Steamboat Willie. He talked in a falsetto voice. He was the first voice of Mickey Mouse. He believed in his dream when he only had a dream to hang on to. He was as successful when he was broke with a hand puppet as he was when Disneyland and Disney World opened. It's just that money flows to great ideas and to persistence. And you and I will get the money because it flows to us if we work. And that's what positive self-awareness is all about. Not seeing the limits and understanding that we are self-limiting. What's holding us back in life? I'll tell you, for me, it's been my self-esteem. And that's the second winning attitude. It doesn't make any difference what you wear, who you are, what you've done, what you own, what you drive. It's how you feel about what you're doing at any given moment in time. Self-esteem is the deep down inside the skin feeling of your own worth. And that's why, as the second winning attitude, it is the single most important quality, in my opinion. It's the internalization of value. It doesn't make any difference what you're doing. It doesn't make any difference what you did last week. It doesn't make any difference what you're going to do tomorrow, but it, it makes a difference of how you feel about your potential. It's that feeling. 
Since self-esteem has nothing to do with performance, it has to do with potential. You and I can separate who we are from what we do. And the one thing you learn with high self-esteem in life is you never carry failure forward. Failure is always left where it belongs as a learning experience, a stepping stone instead of a stumbling block, a temporary inconvenience. I've decided the one way you can spot a winner or loser in the making is the way you project yourself, your value. You always project on the outside how you feel on the inside. You always project on the outside how you feel on the inside. You can't deny it or can't get away from it. And so that's, that's kind of the way it is. I can spot in me other people the ability to accept a compliment and the way you forecast your value to others. When people used to say nice things to me, I threw back all the value they gave me. It's an easy tip-off, rejection of value or acceptance of value. Why would anyone, when you're paid a compliment, not accept it? I'm learning to look at people now and hold their gaze. I'm learning to give them my hand and my name and that it's okay. I'm learning to project value to people. I'm learning never to lead with an excuse. I don't make excuses walking in. I try to give people value and accept it in return. Self-esteem, the single most important quality, the feeling that you got no ceiling. The third winning attitude, in my opinion, is positive self-control. The idea that life is a do it with God, do it for others, do it to myself project. And I can take the credit of the blame for being just about who I've set out to be. It's the unfailing boomerang, the law of cause and effect. What goes around comes around, and it does. Responsibility. The healthiest, happiest, most directed human beings are the ones that believe that they exert a degree of control on the outcome of their lives by the choices that they make. There should be a statue of responsibility. It should stand tall on Alcatraz as a reminder of the rusted remnants of freedoms lost in the past, and that statue of responsibility should be standing high on Alcatraz in San Francisco Bay to match the Statue of Liberty. No freedom without responsible action. Life is a choice. and We make choices in the way we think. And what I've decided to do is study people who make choices. The healthiest people. Volition. How you choose to spend your thoughts. You control your contacts, who you run with who you model yourself after. You control that. You control your concepts, what you think about. You control your causes, what you've repeated over and over again to make your purpose. You control your communications, how you talk and what you say. You control your commitments, how much time you give to any one thing. You control your concerns, how you respond. Losers let it happen. Winners make it happen. Losers see thunderstorms. Winners see rainbows. Losers see icy streets, winners put on their ice skates. Losers take chances, winners make choices. It's all in the way you choose to think. And Earl Nightingale and the scriptures and people through the years have said it best. You do become what you think about most of the time. And most of the time you and I think about winning and success and positive opportunities. And we control that. It's the most exciting thing I've learned. I learned it from the Olympic athletes, believe me. They have that moment, that moment to either choke or come through. And they control how they think just before they perform. And they always think in terms of the desired result. The next winning attitude is if you've got the control of the thought, where would you lead it? You lead it in terms of the imagined self and the next point is a positive self-image, which in fact is no more than goals, because a goal is an image of the self, of yourself in it. And I look at that and I know what's happened to me. Your image of self comes mostly from the conversation that you have with yourself. You know, you and I talk to ourselves at four to 600 words a minute every waking moment of our lives. What do you say when you talk to yourself? Hi, gonna be another good day. It's gonna be a great day for me. Another blue Monday, another Friday. Thank goodness it's Friday. Thank goodness it's Monday. Thank goodness it's today. With my luck, I knew it would fail. 
It's the way we talk. Our imagined self is more based on self-talk than anything else. You are the Chief Justice of your Supreme Court. The most important conversation you'll ever have is the one you have of yourself, with yourself, and it leads to images and pictures and feelings and concepts which become goals when they're planted. Habits start like flimsy cobwebs, then with practice, like cables, we said. I have this little inner voice that goes around with me. I tell it what I'm thinking, I tell it what I see. I tell my little inner voice all my hopes and fears. It listens and remembers everything it hears. At first, my little inner voice followed my command. But after years of training, mine's gotten out of hand. It doesn't care what's right or wrong or what is false or true. No matter what I try now, it tells me what to do. Continuous loop video cassette in my head of the kind of person I think I am, I say I am, I know I am. And you and I have one, like a tape recorder, there, recording everything we've been afraid of, everything we've thought of, everything we've done, and a lot of things that other people have told us that just aren't true, only their opinion. Fortunately for me, however, working with Olympic athletes and Super Bowl champions and winners, I got mine under control. And I know how to give my inner voice positive reinforcement. And when I talk to myself, I always talk with all due respect. Do you know that people make their mind up about you and I based upon our opinion of ourselves? They have no time to check us out, they just listen to what we say. And of all the things we say, you and I need to say things in the direction of a very specific target. Of all the things I know, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. If you don't know where you're going, you'll end up someplace else. You won't recognize it when you get there because you really didn't plan to be there in the first place. The people who are the most specific in life seem to get a goal because the mind is the most marvelous biocomputer ever created. I had the good fortune to have as a professor, Dr. Viktor Frankl, who led the resistance movement at Auschwitz and Dachau during the years of World War II. And Dr. Frankl realized that the people who lived the longest, who made it through those horrible years, were the ones who had magnificent obsessions, who were stuck on a marvelous target. I studied the Korean War. It was the only war in which no American prisoner ever escaped from a minimum security camp. You see, they have a way of checking you out by asking you questions about your life. Hi, soldier, where are you from? Who's your favorite ball team? What are you going to do when you get back? How much money do you need? If you said enough money, someday I'll, uh, I don't really know, I don't have a ball team, uh, I just want to be happy, I just want peace. The mind says, piece of pie, piece of bread, piece of what? What will make you happy? What will make you successful? How much is enough? You need to take the generalities and give them specificity. They took the people with no goals and called them purposeless. They put them in minimum security, cub, minimum security camp country clubs and they tried to reorient them in the library. The death rate went up, the disease rate was up, in the minimum security camp with more food and comfort. In the maximum security camp, they put people like you and I, people who had deep beliefs, people who wanted to get home, people who were going for freedom, who knew how much money we need, what kind of goals we believe in. And they classified them as dangerous because they were leaders. People always follow someone who knows where they're going. And so it was that the maximum security camp was full of purposeful people who were beaten and starved. The death rate went down, the disease rate was down, and many of them escaped. They knew where they were going, and they got there. But those who were there for the duration just stayed, and many young people pulled the covers up over their head and gave up because they didn't have a target. We've always managed to get what our currently dominant thoughts are, and we've always moved into that. You see, you can't come away from an idea. You can only go toward the dominant thought. Through the years, I've learned how to set goals that are just out of reach, but not out of sight. I've learned how to stair-step them like the Olympic athletes. You see, they never try to win the gold. They only try to do a better split, a little faster this, 
a little more of this. They try just to be out of reach, but not out of sight. And they even take pocket computers and figure out what they need to do the next split in to get it. And when they get a goal, because it's close in, they get positive reinforcement for having hit it. When they miss a goal that's close in, they can get easy correction to the target. And of all things to tell yourself, never tell yourself what you don't want to happen, what you don't want to be, what you don't want to recur again. Sports is a microcosm of the world. And in sports, you see it all the time. A coach unwittingly telling a team what not to do in the second half. Don't give him a high outside pitch. He'll knock it out of the park. Put that one in your inner voice, in your little goaltender. High and outside, is that where we don't want to go? Yeah, that's where we don't want to go. That's why we told you that's where we don't want to go, to remind you of where not to go. I wasn't going to go there. I was going to go low and inside, but I'll go high and out, just like you said. You see, the mind can't dwell on the reverse of an idea. The next ball was high and outside, a three-run home around the bases they went. Warren Spahn threw his glove down on the dirt. Eddie Matthews came in and won the World Series for the Braves. And to this day, it rings loudly in my ear. Why would anyone motivate anyone on the reverse of an idea? Why would you ever tell yourself anything except where you want it to go and be? I weigh this much. I'm fit and trim. I can feel my body grow stronger now. I'm achieving my financial goals, not what I don't want to be, but what I want to be, the dominant thought of the winner. The last ring is probably one of the most exciting of all. It's the single most identifiable trait in a winning human being, identifiable because you can smell it, taste it, feel it, see it before it arrives. It's called positive self-expectancy, the self-fulfilling prophecy. You won't necessarily get what you want in life, but in the long run, you'll get what you expect. That's because Sikhi or Fishi the mind controls Soma the body. What the mind harbors, the body manifests. It's mind over muscle, mind over menu, mind over money, and the mind that matters. When the mind talks, the body listens and acts accordingly. I can back that up more than I ever have in my life. Years ago, I used to study psychosomatic medicine, and I met Dr. Herbert Benson from Harvard, one of the great psychosomatic medicine people in the world at Harvard. He studied people in New Guinea who practiced a belief system called voodoo. Voodoo is called pessimism. It's negative belief. Voodoo is what people believe in who expect the worst to happen, and it usually does. It's the pin in the doll. It's the expectation of illness. It's the expectation of the worst and it has a powerful physiological effect on our body and our lives. He actually told of a story where the witch doctor played spin the bone. Remember when we used to play spin the bottle and got a kiss? When you spin the bone, the bone points at the native and the native looks at the bone and says, oh my gosh, in our tribe, that's it. And the native is out of life and out because of belief. If that's the extreme negative, what about the extreme positive? Why is it that luck is laboring under correct knowledge and fear is false education appearing real? If you don't know something about it, you're afraid. If you're lucky, it's because you're laboring under correct knowledge. If you find a role model and you practice and get it right and you begin to prepare and expect, you get optimism, which is the opposite of voodoo. Optimism is the natural high caused by people who are prepared to win by who they model themselves after, what they study, and the persistence they put to that preparation. I get so excited I can hardly stand it. They took blood samples of actors and actresses back in New York, and they found the people who were positive and optimistic in the parts they played had more endorphins, morphine within the blood, the natural high 98 to 200 times stronger, than anything you could take from the outside, no wonder. Endorphine, morphine within, natural morphine is caused by people with high expectations. Opiates are taken by people with low expectations. And because they're not optimistic about their future, because they don't have high self-esteem, because they feel out of control, their awareness tells them they need to be like everybody else. Their esteem tells them they're not worth much. Their control tells them they're out of control. 
Their image tells them that they have no goals, and their expectancy tells them that the only way to get happy is to get a dose, a fix. The people with low self-esteem and low expectancy take opiates from the outside. The only side effects are devastating. Winners in life with high expectations expect to win and do what's necessary. You sing because you're happy, and you're happy because you sing. They both provoke the same idea of optimism.